Well, hello once again, and welcome as we wrap up this series that we've been doing on uh, the unleavened bread of the end time. We're going to wrap this up and we're going to start something new uh, on Saturday. So I know we're going to wrap it up today because I know what I want to do on Saturday. It's been hot and heavy on me. And uh, <clears throat> so we're going to push through and, and finish this up today. Uh, any announcements? Uh, first of all, if you have any prayer requests or anything, you can email them to ephraim.ministries at outlook.com. And that email will be changing as we move forward. Uh, we're going to be uh, standardizing a few things. Uh, continually progressing the ministry is what we're doing. And uh, things are moving, things are building, and it's exciting, and it's exciting times. And you can look for some new things that will be coming out here very shortly. Uh, some big things and some things that are uh, interactive. And I look forward to everybody being able to participate in some of this uh, because we have to develop ministry within our own lives in order to be able to minister to others. And that's the big thing on my heart is that there's a, a nation out here that needs to be reached, and we've got to be able to bring them in and teach them when they come in. And that's what the whole thing is all about, is bringing them into the fullness of what God wants for this day and for this hour, the last day and the last hour on the face of this earth. You know, everything's going to happen in this generation. And it's exciting to be a part of it. It's exciting to be uh, a part of not knowing what God is doing. And it's exciting to be a part of what, knowing what God is doing. And, you know, he's got so much more to reveal to us that we can't even comprehend as human beings as to this God that we serve and how he's going to accomplish what he's going to accomplish in the last days. And the key word there is he, how he is going to accomplish what he's going to accomplish, because this is his game and we are just players in it. That's all we are. And if you can see yourself as just a player in his game, hey, you should be satisfied. And that's what we're all, what it's all about. Being satisfied. What are, what are we satisfied with? The destiny that he has placed within our lives and fulfilling that destiny. And that's where it's so important. So before we get into this, let's go to prayer and, and, and open this thing up. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Father. We thank you for the things that you're doing within our walks and in our lives, Father. The things that are surrounding us, Father, that we're so grateful for. The lessons that you're teaching us. How you're bringing us forward, Father all because of your kingdom on the face of this earth, which needs to be fulfilled and, and needs to be accomplished. Your wills on this earth need to be accomplished to fulfill the things in heaven, Father, that you have already spoken for this earth. And let us go forth. Let us go forth and be good stewards of you, Father. Show us, lead us, and guide us. And right now we take authority of you, darkness, steal, kill, destroy. We know your game plan. We bind you, render you helpless, in Yeshua's name. No need to get excited, no need to yell at you. It's all about the name, not emotion. It's all about the name, and you're bound. You don't have a choice. And we release the power of the Rehakadish to go forth, minister to the people, minister to the lives, minister to the hearts, minister to my heart, even as we bring this forward today. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen. <clears throat> now we're going to be starting off in, in 1 Kings here, and... I'm kind of excited to do this, and I stopped a couple, uh, I guess it was a week ago. Oh, I didn't preach last week or last Saturday, so it was been, it's been almost two weeks now. And, and I stopped right at this point, but what we were talking about when I stopped was about crying out. So as we go through today's service, look at the different points and where people are crying out to the Father. And you're going to see some things in here that you know may jump out at you a little bit, but you can see who's in charge and it's the Father, because that's where we have to go for things, because you're not a healer, I'm not a healer. God works maybe through us to, do, to get things done, but what's that make you? It makes you no different than that, that extension cord that's plugged into that wall over there. You're not the power source, you're just the extension cord. And if we can just look at ourselves and humble ourselves to realize who we are in Him, you know, it's exciting. It's exciting to know that the current is coming through Electricity is coming through, and it's coming through through Him, by Him. And He's the supplier of it all. And as we get our extension cords and we can lengthen them, maybe we can get into a three-pronged extension cord and we can get bigger things plugged into it. You know, we supply to the body. And that's what we have to do. Supply to the body. That's what you have to do. Supply to the body. Supply to each other. <clears throat> so let's look here and... 1 Kings 17, 17. After these things, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. 
sorry, after these things, the son, if that's what I said, I didn't recall, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick, and his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. What happened? He, it was like he was dead. He was dead. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? And here she's crying out to him now. O man of God, have you come to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? What she, she's saying here, like, I, I know I've done some things wrong. I know I'm, in, I'm, I'm into sin. I got some sinful things in my life. And like, did you come here to kill me? Kill my kid? Just to show me that my, uh, the sin in my life? We'll get to that. You see, that's what she was going through, though. That's what she was thinking. That's what was going on in her mindset for what she was going through. She was starting to blame herself for her son's death. He said to her in verse 19, he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her, her bosom, and carried him up into the chamber where he, where he stayed and laid him upon his own bed. And Elijah cried to the Lord and said, There's that, there is that crying out again. And Elijah cried to the Lord and said, O oh my God, have you brought further calamity, calamity upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? He's crying out to God, asking God these questions. He didn't know. He didn't know. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord and said, Oh my God, I pray you, let this child's soul come back into him. See, again, he was crying unto the Lord when things weren't going right. And that's what we've got to do. When things aren't going right in your life, you need to cry unto the Lord. Cry unto the Father. Because he's the supplier. He's the, the power source. And we're just extension cords. I don't know where I came up with that analogy as I was talking. But we have to realize that he's the power. And that's what he was tapping into. And he was crying unto the Father. And that's how you get God's attention. When you cry unto him. You look at Hannah. Hannah cried unto the Father. There's a number of scenarios. We see Elijah here a number of times that we're going to go through crying unto the Father. And he heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the lower part of the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son's alive. Like he knew it all the time probably, eh? No. He remember, he was questioning God. But he took the child and he took him upstairs to get away from any type of distraction as well. So that he could be alone with God and cry unto God. And he brings her down, see, your son's alive. And the woman said to Elijah, By this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Wow. See, what it comes down to, though, is she saw something. She saw something, and she believed something. She pushed right to the edge of existence. And her son was pushed right to the edge of extinction. And here, she cries out. He cries out. See the chain of command? See, you can cry out to the Father now because we have that through the Son. Because you're attached to the vine. But it's important to understand God wants to do for you. But the boy originally didn't die because of her sin. That was just the big question mark. She knew that she was walking in sin. That's not what happened and what was going on there. She had taken Elijah in. She was good to him. She treated him well. And when it comes down to these things, you know that prophets have to fulfill these things as well, crying unto the Father. All the scriptures, we, we, we have to cry unto him. We have to. That's how you get God's attention. But God doesn't hear prayers if you're in sin. And that's why sometimes we've got to stand a gap for other people. And just like other people have, have stood a gap for us. I was on a, a call today and with, a, with a young man. Not that young. Younger than me. And he says, well, how do I compensate you? How do I pay you? I'm like, you don't pay me. I said, somebody once did this for me. And my payment is to do it for somebody else. I said, maybe one day the same thing will happen for you where you yourself can go through a situation 
and you yourself one day can help somebody else through, the, the, through that situation. I said, that's the payment. That's how you pay. Because that's what it's all about. It's all about the body, ministering to the body, bringing things to the body, helping the body. That is what it's all about. And we miss that point so much because of monetary gains that we sometimes get into. You see, but we've got to get to that point where God hears and God performs for the cries of your heart. Unfortunately, sometimes our cries aren't from our heart. Sometimes our cries are from emotion. Sometimes it's cries out of regret. But is it a cry because you really want to change? Have you ever gotten to the point where you cried out because you want to change? I have. I have. Because you know that your life is, is broken. You know it's at a standstill. You know that there's another step to take. And you know it's right there in front of you. And you cry out to the Lord. And He brings you forth. And that happened to me. I was, oh, probably 25 years old. And I got locked out of the house. And I, I knew that I was coming to a, a point in my life and, and things, well, maybe I was a little bit older. Maybe I was about 27, 28 years old. But I knew that it was time to change. It was time to start maybe making a shift. And I sat outside because I got locked out. I could have knocked on the door and, and, and woke my wife up. But, you know, I decided to make a fire. And I sat outside all night long. All night long, right in the middle of my, <clears throat> of my heyday, right in the middle of my sinful days. And I cried unto God, what do you want for me, Father? What? What is it? What do you want for my destiny? I don't understand. What is it? And I spent the entire night. I woke up, I not woke up, I, my wife woke up in the morning and she opened the door and she let me in and she looked at me and she's like, what is wrong with you? My eyes were swollen, my face was swollen. I was crying all night for the things of the Father because I knew that I had a call in my life. Another time where I, I cried out to the, to the Father when I didn't know and I was a confusing point, I went to my first conference, sat with my mentor, Prophet Tom, and he said some stuff to me, and I came back from there, and I was so confused. Confused, no. Things just rattling around in your head. And I was up in the middle of the night, and I was outside crying unto the Father, and Father, you know, what do you want? Show me, give me a sign. And I look up, and I see a shooting star. And then I saw another shooting star, and I saw another shooting star. And I kept crying out to him, and every time I spoke, there would be another shooting star that would happen. And it went on for 23 times. I know the exact numbers. 23 times there were shooting stars right there in front of me when I, when I would speak and I would look around. And I went in the house and it went on for so long. I went in the house and I woke my wife up. I said, you got to come outside and see this. So I went out and I got her and I brought her outside. We're talking middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning. Get her up out of bed. We're looking up in the sky and I told her what was going on and it started Shooting star after shooting star after shooting star. My wife had never seen a shooting star before. And it was one after the other after the other. And I would tell her and it would happen. And then I looked at her and said, it's almost like when I talk, there's another one. And then it stopped. I looked at her and I said, well, maybe I got a little too cocky with that, didn't I? And then it started again. It's all about the Father. But when you're crying out, when you cry out to the Father, He will be there when you're looking for serious direction for your life, for the body's sake, for the body's sake, He'll answer you. Even for your own sake, He'll answer you. But not for your selfish gains, not for your selfish wants, for your selfish wills, not for things that are contrary to what He's trying to get done on the face of this earth. That's why there's so much of a lack of people crying out. And here's the bigger thing, a lack of results from the Father listening, hearing, and giving back as he did even with Elijah, crying out for the wrong things. Selfish gain? Personal ambitions? It's not about that. It's about the Father's plan right here on the face of this earth. You see, when we get to the point where God hears and performs for the cries of your heart, it's great. It's great. But they can't get involved in sin, can he? He can't get involved in sin because he can't defile himself. You see, God wants to fulfill the prayers of everybody, but
but you have to comply to the rules. And the prophets are entrusted with the rules. The prophets that walk the face of the earth are entrusted with the rules. And you're not going to get anywhere with God until you conform to the word. Because there are blessings when you cry out when you're aligned with the Father. There are blessings there waiting when you cry out to the Father. It's like reaching through a wall and being able to take something off that table that's been prepared for you in the wilderness and pulling it back. The cries of your heart. The needs. And even the things that you want, but it's got to be for His kingdom. You can want and want and want for some things, but you'll never get some things. Why? Because first of all, God knows what man is. If it was all about everybody wanting sports cars and motorcycles, everybody would be out riding them on Saturday and wouldn't be sitting in service. Because He knows what He created. The lusts of the flesh can very easily carry people away. And let me warn you, Ephraim, there's something coming around the corner. There's something coming around the corner. There's something on the, on the horizon that's going to try to get in. Spirits of darkness, I'm talking. They're on the horizon holding hands. I'm going to probably do a sermon on it in a couple weeks. We've got time. But it's on the horizon. It's right there. 1 Kings 18, 19. Therefore, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the goddess of Asherah who eat at Queen Jezebel's table. Hi, Mom and Dad. Who eat at Queen Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the Israelites and assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. So Ahab sent to all the Israelites, I'm going to repeat that again, to all the Israelites and assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to the people and said, How long are you going to halt and limp between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. And the people did not answer him a word. And that's not too encouraging, is it? Here you got Elijah, and he's sitting there, and he's just putting them in their spot. And then he says, what are you going to do? And it got quiet. How could you not know what to do? Well, because look what they were surrounded with. Look at the environment they were in. It's like living in this world and that environment and trying to bring it inside to the things of God. It doesn't fit. And they were bringing the, that world. And we'll get into more of that Asherah thing and the Baal. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. But it's not too encouraging. He must have went, what the heck is going on here? Then Elijah said to the people, I, I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. I will distress, I will dress the other bull, lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. Thanks for showing up, guys. My mom and dad are here for the first time. <clears throat> then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the one who answers by fire. Let him be God. And all the people answered, Yeah, it's well spoken. You see, he said, What do you say there? Gods. You see, he brought in the prophets of Baal. He also called for the prophets of Asherah, which is a, a goddess. So we got about 850 prophets in all, in all here. But he was known as what? And we know him as the prophet of fire. Will that happen? Yeah, I can guarantee you it'll happen. He was walking with God, though, wasn't he? Hand in hand. He knew who he was. Look what we just went through back a chapter with the, the little boy. And he brought that boy up, and he cried out unto God. And because of his cries, God heard. Again, we hear Elijah. He's crying out again. We're going to listen to this here. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourselves and dress it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bowl given to them, dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear and answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And they leaped upon or limped about their altar they had made them. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is God. Either maybe he's musing, 
or he's gone aside, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. I can see myself doing this one day because I can mock people like there's no tomorrow. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their customs with knives and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And that still happens today. You get into some of these cultural events of non-Christian religious organizations, and you can see that they have certain days where they whip themselves and they cut themselves, and they'll actually draw blood upon their backs. And you can see even back into the days of when Jesus Christ, he walked into the tombs. And there was a guy there, he says, my name is Legion, because there are many of us. And it says there that he gashed himself and he cut himself. And we see kids these days who are even cutting themselves. They get into this cutting thing. What it's, what's it all about? It's about bail. It's about bail. It's all one and the same. And it's still going on even to this day. Midday passed. And they played the part of the prophets until the time that, for offering the, for, for offering the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no answer, no one who paid attention. See, what happened here? They prophesied, but nothing happened. They prophesied, but nothing happened. Why? Oh, they may have seen some things happen before, but Elijah was there. Elijah brought the anointing, and it's the anointing that breaks the yokes, and it's the anointing that will bind things up. You look with satanic high priests. They can walk into places and they can have things done. But if you bind them, and you see how we bind things before we open every service, we bind the powers of darkness, but from having an influence. Because darkness is real. The powers of darkness are real. And the powers of darkness can affect even those that stand behind these things and preach during sermons. That's why you bind those things up. You see, satanic high priests, they, they've walked into services before that we know of. They've tried to, to, to pull the things that they pulled out here on other ministers and stuff like that. We've seen this happen. And they sit there and they say, I couldn't do what I normally try to do. Why? Because when you're walking right with God and the anointing is high, when your anointing exceeds that of, you can have some success. And we've also got the name of Yeshua. Jesus Christ himself. Does that mean we just plead that? No. I'm saying it's about being connected to the vine. It's about crying out to the Father through that process of the vine and who we are, the blossom at the end of it, going back through, getting back to the trunk of it, which goes up to the heavens like Jack and the Beanstalk, you want to call it. Goes all the way up. And that's where the power comes from. Up there. Again, you got to have a clean vine all the way through the process, attached all the way through, through the Holy Ghost, which is what? Is how you plug into the power source. That's part of the extension cord that gets to you. The blossom at the end of it, the light bulb at the end of it that you're trying to turn on. That's all you are. You're just a tool for the Father. A tool for the Father. So don't get so heavy and high-minded and so thoughtful about yourself, about, oh, I did this and I did that. Well, whip de do. Because you get that kind of an attitude, you won't be doing anything. You won't be laying hands on people. You won't see people get well. You won't see people healed. You'll end up in a mire, running back to your own vomit, like it talks about in Scripture, about running, the dog goes, always goes back to this vomit. You know what that's about? Homosexuality. Homosexuality. And what's all that about? It's about going back to the lustful things of life. And you're going back to the lustful ways that you once had when you start pointing a finger at yourself saying, oh, look at me, look at me, look at me, and giving yourself the glory when you should be giving the glory to the Father upstairs. And that's where the disconnect comes in because we get our flesh in the way. We are made of body, soul, and spirit. And the biggest problem that you have is your flesh. The biggest problem that you have is your soul, which is the mind realm. The biggest problem you have is yourself. And the biggest problem that I have is myself. And when we can learn to get self out of the way, let all the glory be to Him, watch the light bulbs turn on on the other end. Watch the blossoms come. Watch what God's trying to do in your life for the body's sake, not for your glorification's sake, for the body's sake. And that's what it's all about. Th uh, 1830, Then Elijah said to the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the old altar of the Lord that had been broken down by Jezebel. Listen to this. 
he repaired the old altar of the Lord that had been broken down by Jezebel. You know, you can read these scriptures so many times, and this is my favorite story in the whole Bible. This is my favorite story. David's a real close second with almost everything that he's done, but this is my favorite one. Then Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. I'd said before that this stuff was still going on today. The cutting, the Asher, the Ashura, the goddess, Baal, all this stuff is going on today. How are you going to prove them wrong and you right? We're going to show them. That's how you're going to have to do it. You're going to show them. We're going to get to that in a minute, in, in a minute here. Hopefully the next page, because I'm cranked on that one. Yep, next page. Then Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones, Elijah built an altar in the name and self-revelation of the Lord. He made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed, which is about two bushels that we know of today, two bushels of seed. He put the wood in order and cut the bowl in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offerings and the wood. Why? Because he's making sure that nobody could point a finger at him and saying, he did it. He's making sure that the Father gets all the glory. He wanted everybody to know and have no doubt about what God was about to do. It wasn't somebody walked by and flicked a cigar in there or flicked a cigarette or, or lit a match or used some gasoline or whatever. No, he did everything possible that he could do at that point in time to make sure that nobody could say, that wasn't God. And he said, we're in the 1 Kings 18, 34. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord. See, what do we got now? He's crying out again. We got the man of God, the prophet of fire, crying out to who? His power source. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you, the Lord, are God, and have turned their hearts back to you. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifices, and the wood and the stones and the dust, and also licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their face and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Just like the widow who took him in and treated him well, and her boy, what? He died. Took him upstairs. Cried unto the Lord. Came back downstairs. It's the same process, people, all the way through with both these stories. And at the end, she believed because she saw. They believed because they saw. You know why people don't believe? You know why the heathen, the neighbor down the street doesn't believe anymore? Because we can't prove who God is. And we've got to prove in this last day, in this hour, who God is. Because as darkness rises, your anointing has to rise to be able to take it on, or you're going to get swallowed up. And that's the God honest truth. But it took fire for them to believe. It took them to see. It took a demonstration of the power of the Almighty God. And that's what it takes because we have got to confront darkness. We have to confront darkness. And what are you going to do? Remember the story that we, we, we heard? One of some young chap decides he's going to go on a missionary trip. He lands in one of these countries. This is a true story. He lands. They meet him at the airport. The witch doctor gets out his little flute. He's got a basket there. You know how they play the basket? The snake comes up and stuff. Oh, no, not this time. This was a rope. He played it. This rope came out. It went straight up. The guy put the flute down. He climbed up the rope, climbed back down the rope, walked up to the guy, looked him right in the face, and said, what could your God do? What would you do? That's what darkness is doing. What would you do? You know what he did? He got his butt back on the airplane, and he went home. He said, I can't take that on. I would have said, do that again for me. Climb up to the top. And as soon as he got to the top of that rope, I would have bound darkness and watched him smack flat right on the ground. Why? 
anointing, power of God, demonstration of the Father. Not demonstration of man, but that's where things get crossed. You see, and we get into these places like that, and then somebody becomes a Christian. You know what they do to him? Kill him. Kill him. Families kill each other. All because of what? They become Christian. Does it not say that families will be turning families in, family members in, in the end times? We're not talking about somewhere over in the middle of nowhere. We're talking about your neighborhood. We're talking about your cities. That's what's coming to North America, people. Get real about what's going on with darkness. It's not a game anymore. The time for preparation, the time for games is over. This is time to act now. We're here. These are the end times in which we're walking that Scripture speaks of. These things are going to happen. People are going to turn each other in. And people are going to slaughter each other. And they're going to slaughter family members. You see, that's how much they believe that their God is when they are whatever religion they want to be and call religion whatever you want. But it's bondage. That's the definition of it. Whatever they are. And then they, oh, you're a Christian now? They will kill family members, wives, kids, parents. You think they counted the cost? You're darn right they counted the cost, but that's how much they believe. And we need to have that kind of belief in the living God, but we don't as Christians. Why? Answer the question. It's the demonstration. It's the demonstration is what turns people, though. Because talk is cheap. See, you look at you can have words and you can say things for your own benefit, and you're speaking things into what you need for your life and putting them into the planting. We got, we've gone through that process, if you've been listening. But when you're out there and you're just talking and shooting your mouth off here, your talk is cheap. Your words are of absolutely no value because there is no reward for your wishes. You see, what it comes down to, when you hear thunder, what do you do? Oh, something going on up in the sky. When you see lightning, what do you do? They shut the soccer game down, they'll shut the baseball game down, they shut everything down. See, it's not just about, oh, hearing. You can't just be a, oh, I'm just going to talk about it. Be a doer of the word. Be a doer of what God says that he's got for his people in this book. In the word of God. It's not the thunder. It's not empty words. It's the results. People want to see the lightning. People fear the lightning. People don't die because of thunder. They die when lightning strikes, though. You've got to realize, and I'm calling it out, yeah, I'm calling it out, because enough is enough of the games out here. We've got to, we've got to show, because we have too many people that say many words of wisdom, but too few people who perform acts of wisdom. How do you like that one? You see, you get into this whole thing and you talk about the, how much they believe their God is. You have got to believe beyond what they believe, just like your anointing has got to exceed their anointing in the things that they're doing. You see, you look at the prophets of Baal, even what we went through. They were offering their own blood. You see, Elijah knew, but Elijah also knew what power he walked in. You see, Power in the end days is going to be more than prevalent. You're going to need it. Let's jump over to Matthew 3.11. Get away from that or I'll keep preaching on Elijah for the next week. I indeed baptize you in water because of repentance. That is because of your changing your minds for the better, heartily amending your ways with ab ab abhorrence. It's not even a Jewish word. I can't remember how you pronounce it. Abhorrence of your past sins. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to, or fit to, 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 to take off or carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is, his winnowing fan, shovel, fork in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear out and clean his threshing floor and gather and store his wheat in his barns. But the chaff he will burn with fire that cannot be pulled out. You see, the fire is on its way, but it's about a purging. 
See, if you have the Holy Ghost, you have the fire. You're plugged into the power system of the Father. That's the conduit between the Father, one of the extension cords to the end result of who you are, the light bulb at the end of it. That's part of the power source. And you've got to be plugged into the Holy Ghost. You've got to have the Holy Ghost to have that power. And that's where it comes from. But the thing is, realize one thing, it is unquenchable. Just like that fire came down and it licked up everything. Couldn't quench it. It licked up the, the dirt, the dust, the meat, the water. It was unquenchable. And that's what you're going to be. You're going to be unquenchable when you're doing the things of the Father, when you've got to demonstrate. But you've got to get, and it always comes back down to this, and I can't go a week without sin. You've got to get the sin out of your life. And it's not always the known sin that you know. It's the sin that you think that you don't even, don't even think that sin. It's the, the cultural sin. The things that we're so easily beset by. The things that we grow up with. The things that we look and we just say, oh, that's just normal. No, it's not. It's sin. Judgment. Gossip. Oh, just because I'm not out here murdering anybody or robbing a bank. You know, God's looking for you to be clean. You were created in His image. You were created clean. And we perverted ourselves. And we have to unpervert ourselves. And we have to go in and take a nice little shower, a nice little mikvah, clean ourselves up, get rid of the sin out of our lives through the blood of Jesus Christ. He didn't die in vain, people. And the next time you want to go back and you want to sin for the sin that you've already asked forgiveness for multiple times, how many times are you going to crucify Him? Go pick up a hammer and a nail and do it to your own hand every time you think that you're going to just want to go out there and sin again. I bet you you'll stop a little bit quicker. But no, it's okay. We'll just crucify Him again. Crucify Him again. You see, He died for your sin. He didn't die for your repetition so that you can just feel good about yourself. He died to make a way for you to get to heaven. You see, that is the thing. Is for, that is for after the flesh. That's for after the flesh. That's your ticket to heaven. You just ever get buy a ticket to go on a roller coaster? Or you, you, buy, you stand in line, you stand in line. This world and this walk in which we have, we're standing in line, standing in line, standing in line. We got this ticket. And at the end we go, okay, can I get on now? And there you go. That's what that ticket is for. You still have a life to live on the face of this earth. You still have a life to live on the face of this earth. But it's the power of God. And it's coming back to this earth in a great way. But what it comes down to is you have got to go through the process that I've been talking about today. Crying out from, the, from, from your heart. As Hannah cried out. As Elijah cried out. As the widow cried out. And stay attached through the process, through the vine, all the way through the end result. And making sure that that flow of power stays clean within your walk. And the only thing that interferes with that is if it gets frayed and sin will, it will fray that. Sin will fray that and stop that from happening. Let's go to John 15.1 now. John 15.1. You see, we get so many people out here that they think they get saved and they get filled with the Holy Ghost and that's the end of the matter. And it's not. That's the beginning of the matter. That's the beginning of the matter. You know why? And here's the proof. Because the same sinful thoughts that you had the day before you got saved are the same sinful thoughts that you're going to have the day after. Because it's a process that you've got to work yourself out of the mess that you worked yourself into. Because you have to go through it to learn not to do it again. John 15, 1. I've been waiting for seven weeks to read this. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Here's the process that we've been talking about here. And any branch in me that does not bear fruit, that stops bearing, he cuts away, trims off, takes away, and he cleanses it and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit. Repeatedly? Well, what about the repeated sin? Doesn't he? Well, that's not what we just read here. If you're not producing, you get cut off. But if you are producing, He makes you better and He makes you produce more because He'll take care of you. He cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. What fruit would that be? Fruit of the Spirit. 
Love, joy, peace, all those things that, oh, fine, we don't need to worry about that. Let's talk about demonology. No, let's go back to fruit of the Spirit. Let's go back to fruit of the Spirit. Let's get, let's get back to the things that will get you to heaven. Because those things will get you to heaven, along with obviously having Yeshua. But that will keep you attached to the vine. You are cleansed and pruned already because of the word which you have given, which I have given you, the teachings I have discussed with you. Dwell in me, and I, and, and I will dwell in you. Live in me, and I will live in you. Just as no br- branch can bear fruit on, of itself without abiding in, being vitally united to the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever lives in me, and I in him, bears much abundant fruit. However, apart from me, cut off from vital union with me, you can do absolutely, it doesn't say absolutely, but that's me saying that, you can't do a doggone thing. You can't do it. You're nobody without him. I'm nobody without him. It's about the process. John 15, 6, if a person does not dwell in me, he is thrown, he is thrown out like a broke-off branch and withers. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire, and they are burned. If you live in me, abide vitally united with, uh, to me, and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. That's where we want to live, isn't it? That's where we want to live, but we've got to get there. We've got to get there. If you're not already there or you're working towards it, even if you are there, guess what? It's work to stay attached to the vine because darkness is going to come and try and cut you off. How? By enticing you with sin. By going through the purpose of temptation. You're going to have to go through that. And you're going to have to make sure that you remain. You remain attached. And you remain attached by getting yourself put together according to the Word and live by the Word of God. And one of the things is, produce the fruit of the Spirit and produce the fruit of the Spirit consistently. Consistently. In season and out of season. When you're happy, you got to produce it. When you're angry, guess what? you got to produce it. When you want to get into a fight with your wife, not that I have ever, not, ever gotten a fight with my wife. We've had a great marriage. We've never fought. No, you know that's a lie. <laughs> but you know what? You've got to produce fruit. And if we could eliminate self, and you know why I'm using that example? Because we've all been there. Anybody who's married knows that we've all been there. But if you could just stop in the middle of your argument and say, am I producing good fruit right now? Or am I producing rotten fruit right now? You should probably just take all your clothes off and and get naked and stand there because that's how much of a fool you look like. You're absolutely naked in front of God and you don't even have an attachment to the vine anymore because you're not producing fruit. Oh, you get reattached real quick, eh? When you make up and you say sorry and... It's kind of like what we do with the Father, though, isn't it? How many times do we kick against the pricks of what the Father says to do? And we fight and we... Is that fruit? Show me the fruit in being disobedient to the Father. Let's go over to Jeremiah 1.9. Oh, yeah, back it up with something? Yeah, bring in the big boys. Jeremiah 1.9. Then the Lord put forth His hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put words in your mouth. You see, I know of people who have had words put in their mouth. I know of people who have had darkness show up and put their finger right on their lips and say, "Uh uh-uh. And unless you know how to fight that, unless you know how to fight that, you will lose. You have to know how to fight that. You have to know how to be able to squeeze out the name of Yeshua to start just to release that so that you can start going into what you've got to do. That is the power of darkness. You see, but it's the anointing. It's the anointing. Again, put words in his mouth. You see, the anointing gives you what you need. I could have a sermon here and look at half the stuff I've been talking about today. Not even in here. But it's the anointing, and it will change to, to, to meet the needs of the people that are listening and the people that will listen. 
How many times have I had questions and I would just go through the CDs, especially early on, I'd have questions. Well, what about this? And I would just be patient. And I would wait. And it would come. For two, three weeks, maybe. Get in the Scriptures. Oh, there it is. You know what? You've got to do what you've got to do. And how many times are needs met? How many times have your needs been met, my needs been met, when we sit in front of somebody who brings the anointing and it changes your life because that's what it, do. it, it does. It breaks the yokes. It breaks the bonds. But you've got a level of play, of play in that as well. We'll get to that in a second too. Jeremiah 1.10 See, I have set thee this day, appointed you to the oversight of the nations and of the kingdoms. Six-step process here I've, always, I've talked about before. To root out, to pull down, to d- destroy, to overthrow, to build, and to plant. You see, that's what prophets do, and they don't really, people don't really like it. You know what happens? You get into the first four steps of it where it's all the ripping down and kicking you in the shins and beating you over the head. They don't stick around for the last two stages, the building and the planting. Again, it's a process to go through. Can you endure the process? Can you endure the process? That's what they're set there to do. Psalm 133.1. Psalm 1331. And everybody thinks that, oh, well, we can beat each other up then, right? No. You know what your job is to do? To love one another. To love one another. Not that hard to figure out unless you don't know what love is. Again, it's one of the fruits. Uh Uh-oh. Psalm 133.1. A song of ascent by David. Oh, how good. How pleasant it is for brothers to live together in harmony. It's like fragrant oil on the head of... Oh, isn't this so nice? It's like fragrant oil on the head that runs down over the beard, over the beard of Aaron, and flows down on the collars of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon that settles on the mountains of Zion. For it was there that Adonai ordained the blessing of everlasting life. You know, you look at that, you're like, oh yeah, it would be great. Well, then do it. You know what you got to do? Again, get yourself out of the way. Get your own hurts. I hurt, so I want them to hurt. I've got pain, so I want them to feel my pain. I got into an argument, and she said this, so I'm going to say that. You know what it is? It's revenge. It's a spirit of revenge. And you know what? People get addicted to it. You get addicted to it. Somebody hurts me, and I want to hurt them more. What is wrong with your walk? You're broken. You're broken. And that needs to be fixed within your walk. The nice thing is, you know how to fix it already. Matthew 18, 19. I got about three pages left and I'm finishing this today. I said I was going to. Again, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree, harmonize together, make a symphony together about whatever, anything, and everything they may ask, it will come to pass and be done for them by the Father in heaven. For wherever two or three are gathered, Drawn together as my followers into my name, there I am in the midst of them. Let me ask you this question, though. I'm a realist. When two or three agree, why doesn't it work? Will somebody answer that question? Why doesn't it work? You see, a person's faith has something to do with it. We just did a series on on faith. So you've got to be able to pull this stuff forward as the way that God has been bringing this forward in the last... Eight, ten weeks. A person's faith has something to do with it, but a strong anointing will break the yoke if they can rely on it. If they can rely on it. Let me tell you something, though. The fruit really helps a lot in that process, too. Because that makes you connected to the vine, producing, being pruned, producing more. You see, you've got to be set free And people need to be set free of doubt and unbelief. It's one of the biggest killers in the Christian community is doubt and unbelief. Why? Because we've heard so much BS out there. So much hot air, so much people talking and not working and not performing. A lot of thunder, but no lightning. It comes down to the lightning. That's what it's going to be in the end days. That's what it's going to be in the end days. It's the lightning. Ephesians 4.1 I therefore, the prisoners of the Lord, appeal to you and beg you, walk, lead a life worthy of the divine calling which you have been called, with behavior that is a credit to the summons to to God's service. It's all about the Father again, isn't it, here, eh? Again, it's what? 
leading a life. You see, what's leading a life? Let's break it down. You ever do this? You ever just get into it and just stop? I've spent days on one scripture digging into it. Leading a life. Well, let's okay, what's a life? I'm made up of body, I'm made up of soul, and I'm made up of spirit. Okay, I got the flesh. Okay, that's a problem. We know that the mind and everything that goes on in the mind is tied to the soulish realm. Well, that's going to be a problem. And then you've got the spirit that's trying to tell the other two that, hey, you're a problem, and I'm trying to do this, but you're fighting against me. So we've had this inner fight within ourselves of darkness because we still need the flesh delivered of the flesh. We still need to be delivered of the thoughts of the mind. Oh, just because I think that that person needs a punch on the nose and I don't do it, what's that? That's not producing fruit in the soul. You see, if you can produce the, the fruit of the Spirit in the flesh, if you can produce the fruit of the Spirit in your mind, well, then you're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit in the spiritual realm, and you're going to grow. But we get these thoughts in our head. And you know what we do? We just sit there and we start entertaining, and the next thing you know, 10 minutes goes by, and you're like, oh, I just drove 15 miles down the road. What was I thinking about? Murdering somebody in, in the Spirit? through your mind. You're no better than the guy that's sitting in prison that did it. You're still guilty in the eyes of God. But that's the walk that we have to perfect. That's the walk that God is demanding for ministers and ministry and the body of Christ. That's the walk that He's demanding. Be clean, body, soul, spirit. Produce the fruit in the body. Produce the fruit in the soul. Produce the fruit in the spirit. And that won't be a problem to do it in the Spirit when you've got the other two under control. It's a process to get there, though. Has anybody arrived? No. Anybody not arrived? Nobody's arrived. Because Paul said this is a race until the end. It's a walk that goes until the day we hand in that ticket to get onto the roller coaster that takes you what? Fly it away, sweet Jesus? No, it takes you to heaven. I'm not mocking anything. Don't get me wrong. But it takes you that long, and it's going to be a work until the day that your feet leave the face of this earth. Ephesians 4.3, be eager, strive earnestly. Let me go back and finish the other one. I therefore, the prisoners of the Lord, appeal to you and beg you to walk and lead a life worthy of the divine calling to which you have been called, with behavior that is a credit to the summons to, the, to God's service. Living as becomes you with complete loneliness of mind, which is humility, and meekness, unselfishness, gentleness, mildness, with patience, bearing with one another and making allowances because you love one another. All about the fruit there. But what it is, it's putting up with each other in love. Can we just start trying to like each other as human beings first? And we'll get into the love thing afterwards. But, you know, for those who know, for those who study, and for those who really care what the Father said, put up with in love. 4.3, I want to read that in a different translation. Be eager and strive. No, it's not a different translation. I just have it written down twice. Be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony and oneness and produce by the Spirit and the binding power of peace. The binding power of peace. You see, people want to be unlovely at times. You know who, what kind of people want to be unlovely? Oftentimes it's defense, a defense mechanism where people will be unlovely to try and hold people off and hold them at bay and hold them off a little bit. Why? Because they're worried. They're worried. They're worried that somebody's going to get close to them. Sometimes people have a hard time just allowing people just to love them. And if you have a hard time allowing people just to love you, you're going to have a hard time allowing the Father in to love you. And if you can't allow and accept love, how can you ever give love? How can you give love? Be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony and oneness of and produced by the Spirit and the binding power of peace. That's why I had it written down twice because I had to read it after that again. You see, we just think sometimes that God's going to just show up, pour the oil, and where we, away we go. That's youthful enthusiasm by some young ministers. It doesn't work like it's a process. It's a training ground. 
like we said, Prophet had a two-year training ground. It took most of us seven, eight years to get through it. Seven, eight years. Why? Training, 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 training. Not that we're slow learners, but we're slow learners. Colossians 3.12 Clothe yourself, therefore, as God's own chosen ones, His own picked representatives. You're a picked representative who are purified and holy and well-beloved by God Himself and putting on behavior marked by tender-hearted pity and mercy, kind feeling, a lowly opinion of yourselves, gentle ways and patience, which is tireless and long-suffering, again, talking about fruit again, and has the power to endure whatever comes with good temper. I want to read that out of a different translation. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Again, different translation, same fruit, same fruit, but humbleness of mind. Again, that is a tough one. That's what I was talking about. Fruit of the Spirit. Producing it in in your mind. Producing the fruit of the Spirit in your mind. That's what it's talking about here. Humbleness of mind. Because God wants you holy in every realm in which you walk. And that's why our thoughts, our thoughts have got to be into subjection to the Word. They've got to be into subjection to the Word. And that's why we have to take steps to make that happen. Because it's not going to happen just because you showed up or put it on YouTube, or listen to a tape or a CD, or sat in front of one service, or listen to one and read one chapter out of the Bible, or whatever. No, it's going to happen because you took steps to make it happen. Forbearing one another, Colossians 3.13, forbearing one another in love and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity. What's charity? Charity being, here means love. Put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. The bond of perfectness. You see, when peace is there, when peace is there, you you really don't care if your garage burned down. You don't care if somebody said something bad about you. You know how many bad things get said about me being on YouTube? You, you You don't even really care. When you know that you're doing the things of the Father, and you know that the fruit is there, and you're producing the fruit, most of the time I try, you're producing the fruit, and the fruit's there, and peace is there, because you're walking into it, because you're still attached to the vine all the way through, you don't care about those things. Because you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing, and what you're doing is for the Father above. Colossians 3.15 And let peace, the soul harmony which comes from Christ, rule and act as an umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds in that peaceful state to which as members of Christ, one body, you were also called to live and be thankful, appreciative, giving praise to God always. Let the word spoken by Christ the Messiah have its home in your hearts and minds. In your hearts and minds and minds. Isn't that a good place to have it? Again, back to the soulish realm. And dwell in you and all its richness as you teach and admonish and train one another in all insight and intelligence and wisdom and spiritual things. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody to God. Making melody to God with His grace in your hearts. You see what it talks about here, though? As you teach and admonish and train one another, You see, people take admonishment as, okay, now here's the chance. I'm going to wind up. I'm going to admonish them, and I'm going to admonish them. You know what admonish means? Talking to them gently. But we have this concept of what admonishment is. It sounds like a harsh word, so we treat it like a harsh word, or we act it out like the harsh word. What we're doing is misrepresenting Scripture. Admonish here to talk to them gently to gently point something out. Because you're not going to fix anybody. They're going to fix themselves. You can't choose for them. They can't choose for you. But you can show them, hey, brother, uh, you might want to look at that a little bit different. You see, people try to do what Jeremiah was doing in the first four steps there. 
I'm going to root it out, and I'm going to pull it down, and I'm going to destroy it. That's not your role. It's not your job as the, a member of the body. To admonish them is to help them and walk them through it. And how did it say to do it? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody to God with His grace in your hearts? Kind of puts a different perspective on how we're supposed to admonish each other. And whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus and in dependence upon His person, giving praise to God the Father through Him. You see, there's a couple more stu- verses here. We can get into Daniel. You know what? I'm going to do it. I've only got about five more verses and then we're going to be done. Daniel 12, 5. Daniel 12, 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two others, the one on the, ri- the brink of the river of this side and the other on the brink of the river on that side. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long shall it be? to the end of these wonders. And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right and his left hand toward the heavens and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times and a half a time. Three and one half years. And if you want me to get into that, you don't want to know where we're at in there. And when they got, and when they have made an end of shattering and crushings, the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. He is going to scatter the power, it says here. The shattering and crushing. That's what it's talking about. Shattering and crushing of power of the whole, these holy people. All these things shall be finished. You see, once the power has been scattered, once the power has been scattered, the scattering will be completely finished. The shattering will be completely finished. There will be no more scattering. You see, the power of Christianity, though, has been scattered. And it's been fragmented to the point that you can't even recognize it, to the point that you can't even identify the Christian down the street or the heathen that is beside him. It's so watered down as to what God truly wants for a walk and his ways. Why? Oh, just everything's okay. Oh, it's just okay. No, it's not. In whose eyes are you looking at it? In whose scriptures? In whose word of God? In who's God? Is it the God of Ashura? Is it the God of Baal? Well, it's okay to them. But to not get these things in line with your walk and in your life, what God are you serving? I'm not challenging you on that tonight. I know where most of you are walking. But there's people out here that you're going to encounter as this thing grows and develops, and they come in, and you're going to have to teach them this stuff to get this stuff out of their life. What's this stuff? This sin that so easily besets them. The sin of the culture in which we live in, the society that we live in, the things that we've accepted into our churches, the things that we've accepted into our denominations. That you know, homosexuality is okay. You can have drugs over here, and it's okay. We'll just start another church, and we can have a marijuana smoking church. You know, it's not okay. That's not what my Bible says. It's not what my God says. What does your Bible say? What is your God saying? And who is the God that's speaking out of your mouth when you try and pull that crap? That's what it comes down to. Who is your God? You better know Him. And if a God, let's go to Mark 3, 24. And if a kingdom is divided and rebelling against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided, split into factions and rebelling against itself, that house will not be able to last. And if Satan has raised an an, an insurrection against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is surely coming to an end. Again, why is there 2,300 different sects of Christianity and one word of God? Why is there 2,300 different sects of Christianity and one God? God's got one way. One way. One word. One set of rules. And He wants it done His way. And it's a matter of getting to the depth of His word and bringing it forward and putting it into our lives and being a doer of His Word, not just a hearer, not just thunder, but be the lightning, and you can be the lightning. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come before You, and we thank You, Father, for Your Word. We thank You for the guidance that You've given us within it, the instruction book, Father, that You gave us for our lives and for our walk. 
as we walk through the face of this earth, Father, right up into the heavens, Father. You've provided it all for us, the process. And we thank you, Father, for being attached to the vine. And for those who feel they've been disconnected from the vine, reattach them. Reattach yourself. Say the prayer and reattach yourselves to the vine. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. And Satan, we bind you from stealing this from them. From trying to steal, kill, destroy, because that's what you do. You don't have any right to it. You don't have any authority to it. And they bind you from it until they can stand and they can fight on their own. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Well, everybody have a great week. And we'll see you on Saturday.